all these other discussions about different views of covenants and two kingdoms, all these other things were completely outside of my awareness at the time. And, you know, I slowly started getting involved into the reformed world and all the intramural debates going on there. And it was kind of a rude awakening to realize that not everyone agrees on these really important issues. And so for me, my first exposure to kind of the shock of that was uh, being a young student um, in 1992 at Westminster, California. I'm probably, what, 24 years old at the time. And <clears throat> finding out that among the faculty themselves, they were having debates. And of course, they tried to keep it muted. They didn't want to like break out into the open to these big fights, be very unseemly. But the way it worked was the students would ask questions of one professor, get his answer, <laughs> and then go to the other professor and ask what he thought about something. Yeah. And then pretty soon you would find out that there were some disagreements. Uh, the biggest disagreements were, so back at that time, the faculty of Westminster in California uh, was very different from the faculty today. In fact, it was completely different. Uh, back then, uh, some of the debates were between Meredith Klein and John Frame, and between Meredith Klein and uh, Dr. Bob Strimple, who was the systematics professor. And there were some others as well, but those are the two big ones. Uh, Strimple was a disciple of John Murray. So Strimple did his uh, master's degree, I believe it was, under John Murray back in the 19, I'm thinking 60s, somewhere in there. And so he was basically following John Murray's covenant theology and strongly disagreed with Meredith Klein on the idea of republication, on the idea that there is a, a repetition in some way of the works principle that was originally established in the garden, mm -hmm. but repeating that in the mosaic economy. Uh, that part he was uncomfortable with. And um, so we would go back and forth. We would ask Klein, what do you think? You know, and we'd go to Strimple and ask him, what do you think? And he would be kind of annoyed. Strimple was annoyed because he thought that Meredith Klein should stick with Old Testament. He's an Old Testament professor. He should just stick to, you know, explaining the higher critical views and all that. Why is he talking about systematic theology in terms of the locus of covenant theology? And why is he even dipping into the book of Revelation and talking about eschatology? He should just stick with Old Testament <laughs> studies, just be an Old Testament scholar and not bother his head with broader <laughs> systematic issues. Oh, man. Not realizing that that was what Klein was all about. Yes, yes, he was an Old Testament professor, but he was a very systematic thinker. And his yeah. whole way of thinking was very architectonic and synthetic and looking at the entire big picture from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. He couldn't do his studies in, in the book of Genesis, for example, without looking at Paul in Romans and you know, the book of Revelation and all that, he had to see it all connected. Amen. Um, so that was one of the debates we had. The other debate was between uh, Meredith Klein and John Frame, as you document in your book, mm. uh, where you, you have a whole section on Frame's uh, triperspectivalism and how it differs from, from Klein. But one of the key things there, surprisingly, okay, this is the thing that surprised me anyway, was that... Uh, at that time, as a student in the early 90s, this whole issue of the so-called Reform Two Kingdoms debate had not yet become a, a topic, at least not by that name, hmm. okay? That yeah. terminology, Two Kingdoms, that didn't exist yet. What, what did exist and, in terms of terminology? At the, sorry, just to interrupt. You know, what, what did you guys use to talk about that thing? What, what was that? Well, we didn't we didn't really talk about that thing that much. Wow. We did have debates over post-millennial theonomic Reconstructionism, like, yeah. right, which like, is yeah. a version of, of yeah. transformationalism, but we weren't really thinking about the opposite view. Like, what is the substitute that we're putting in its place right, in terms like, yeah. of two kingdoms and common grace and all that? That wasn't a big topic of discussion. You weren't using but, terms but, like spirituality uh, of the church or, or anything like that. Well, like I'm saying, it wasn't even wasn't even a thing. Yeah, all right. We weren't even really discussing that topic yet. Yeah, we were discussing theonomy. We were discussing whether the Bonson's thesis that the civil laws of uh, the Mosaic Covenant are still applicable today in society. We did discuss that. Yes. But in terms of like the alternative, like so yeah. if you guys are not theonomists, then what do you put in its place? Yeah. yeah. 
we hadn't really uh, interesting. So interesting. figured that yeah. out yet. We weren't really <laughs> discussing common grace that much. We weren't really discussing the Noahic covenant that much. Wow. That comes from later. That's amazing. Um, yeah. But but here's the interesting. So what I was going okay. to say was yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing that surprised me back then uh, about the debate between Klein and uh, Frame, at least as a student, from a student's perspective. Now, I know mm. that there was a faculty discussion which you document in your book, hmm. um, where Klein wrote a paper um, critical of John Frame's approach to the theonomy debate. Yes. And Klein, uh, Klein was saying, no, there's a clear difference between my view and Bonson. You know, yeah. Frame was trying to water down the water difference, down the difference and say, well, it's just a different perspective. You yeah. know, Klein is just emphasizing the situational perspective in terms of how these laws should be applied. And Bonson is emphasizing the normative perspective in terms of the law of God being the authority. Yeah. And Klein's like, no, 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 you're missing the whole point. It's not just about different perspectives here. This is like yeah. a fundamental distinction of understanding, uh, you know, the the way in which the old covenant is related to the new covenant. It's a yeah. big theolo mm -hmm. covenant theology issue. Uh, so I know that that debate was happening among the faculty, but as a student, I didn't really hear about that. I didn't know much, oh, well, much about that. Yeah. What, what we knew, okay, the big thing on the plate as a student was yeah. that the faculty of Westminster in California was basically... Uh, transplanted faculty from Westminster and Philadelphia, mm. right? All of those faculty originally came from Philadelphia. Well, except for Klein, because at the time he was teaching at Gordon Conwell, right. but most of the faculty like Strimple, Godfrey, Frame, the core faculty were former professors at Westminster and Philadelphia, and they transplanted over to California to start Westminster in California. Yeah. And so as a result, and that happened at what time? That happened around what, 1988, 89? I can't remember right. the exact beginning right. point of the founding of Westminster West, but late 80s. And think about what's going on in the 80s in Philadelphia. Westminster Sh and Philadelphia. Shepherd. Oh, yeah. The Shepherd controversy. Yeah. Yeah. So that was what we were tuning into. Yeah. Two Kingdoms was not on the horizon yet, other than yeah. that we were debating Bonson. But over for for us the main thing was the remnants the hangover of the remnants so here we are let's say for my me as a student in 1992 to 1996 the shepherd controversy was only a decade old and they're mm. all still reeling from it and they're still thinking about it and they're still discussing it and people are taking sides and some are defending shepherd and some are criticizing shepherd mm. mm. and so we had uh, meredith klein and Bob Godfrey, who are clearly staunchly saying Shepard was wrong, he's denying sola fide. Uh, but then we had professors like John Frame, who were trying to do the same thing that yeah. he did with the Bonson debate and right. say, well, it's just a different perspective. You guys yeah. are just arguing over nothing. <clears throat> and he was uh, taking the side of defending Shepard. So yes. for me, the experience was raising my hand in John Frame's class and saying, so is this how we would explain Shepard's error? And then he just reacted with this reaction of like, who told you that it was an error? You oh, know, yeah. where are you getting this from? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so just remind me at this out, point, oh, what, okay. what was Shepard's thing again? What, 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 was, what was the normal Turning Turning so. faith into obedience. Yeah. So faith is faithfulness? So the nature of saving yeah. faith. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Again, remember what's still going like on. Thing. It is still a thing, but remember what was going on uh, over on the West Coast with uh, John MacArthur. He published his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, in 1988, yes. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's That's exactly it the somewhere. same thing. He he. MacArthur is totally outside of the sphere of the reform discussion. He doesn't know anything about yeah. it, but he's doing the exact same thing that Norman Shepard is doing, which is that they're reacting to an easy believism out there in the evangelical world that says. Hey, if you just yeah. go forward once at a Billy Graham crusade and you pray to receive Christ, then it doesn't matter what happens after that. If you fall away from faith in Christ and become a Muslim or reject Christ altogether, become an atheist, you're still saved. Mm -hmm. Once saved, always saved. If you just pray that prayer, you're locked in, you're guaranteed that you're going to heaven. You don't need to persevere in faith. Mm -hmm. And so MacArthur over on the West Coast, totally unaware of what was going on in Philadelphia, and Shepard in Philadelphia, they're both reacting to this easy believism and they're saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. You know, the Bible says mm. we have to persevere in faith. Mm. Um, and in the process of doing that, of reacting against this antinomian easy believism, they end up going too far 
as is understandable, mm -hmm. but totally, you know, very, very uh, suicidal, right? Because you're right, basically yeah. cutting the, you're, you're destroying the gospel by saying yeah. that we're justified by not just trusting in Christ, we're justified by the faithfulness, the obedience, the repentance that is all wrapped up into faith. Yeah. And so it ends up denying sola fide. It ends up saying that we're saved by our obedience by our faithfulness. Mm. You'll be mm. glad to know that John MacArthur has done a, a review on that. And in his gospel, according to Paul, he did a correction. So he, he, he uh, he's now more orthodox on that question. Yes. Um, although even there, there's some lingering lack of clarity in MacArthur. And this is a whole debate that I'm having because okay. of my location in Santa Clarita. Is that with R. Scott yeah. Clark and the Gospel According to John MacArthur a podcast that he's doing at the moment? Mm, yeah. Uh, but my location in Santa Clarita is only a few miles from the Master's University, oh, which wow. is the college that John MacArthur used to be the president of, but it's still under his uh, yeah. under his leadership, in a sense, and his theological vision. Man. And uh, I get students from there all the time who are shocked when they say, you know that MacArthur uh, in 1988 said that we're justified by obedience, that faith is obedience. And they're shocked to find that. And then hmm. the thing is, though, is that it's true that he has made some some uh, motions of clarifying things, but there's still a lingering uh, general tendency, maybe not to say that we're justified by obedience, but at the very least that that's how we get assurance. Like the assurance does not come from trusting in the promises of the gospel. Assurance comes from looking at your fruit and seeing that you have the obedience. And so there's still a lot of clear lack of clarity. And the reason for the lack of clarity is because you're not going to ever get that issue right unless you understand the covenant of works and the covenant of mm, grace. Mm. In other words, it goes back just like with this discussion of two kingdoms. <clears throat> well, yeah. It all I'm goes back to your underlying yeah. covenant yeah. theology. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. And this as long exactly as you don't right. clear... Yeah, if you don't clearly understand the idea that there is a covenant of works that Adam broke and that Christ now, he fulfills the requirement of the covenant of works and earns the reward for us. If you don't understand that, then you'll never get this issue of sola fide right. You can yeah. still kind of make some way toward like, okay, it's faith yeah, and yeah. obedience is the fruit, but but then you're still lacking this clarity because you don't have that underlying law gospel yeah. distinction in place mm. to make sense of it all. Okay, I'm, so, I'm not aware uh, of the, the, the niceties yeah. of the debate around John MacArthur, but I yeah. do have some reformed, they call themselves reformed dispensationalists who subscribe yes. to Isn't that covenant bizarre? of redemption, covenant right. of works, covenant of grace. And uh, they are cohorts with me in defending the nature of yeah. saving faith in certain debates that I'm having. Yeah. And um, and they, they've they got an inside line to John MacArthur and reckon that, you know, the right. reform view is now the, the uh, official view. Yeah, so I assume you're talking about people like Peter Sammons. These uh, are Microcardi, Peter Sammons. Microcardi and Peter Sammons, yeah. right. These are people who are in the orbit of the MacArthur yeah. thing, which is the Master's University, the Master's uh, Seminary, and all of that. And they are becoming closer and closer to being 1689, you know, London Baptist. Uh, um, so some of them are saying thinking. John Owen is is very yeah. close to their, their version yeah. of covenant theology at their yeah. like. Yeah. So. <laughs> and and the question is, to what extent can they still claim to be dispensationalists? Right, and there's an right. internecine debate going on within the yeah. MacArthur community over that very question. And it's very difficult. You press different people, different people give you different answers. Some will yeah. say that they're closer to progressive dispensationalism. Some, like you new said, covenant these theology. particular ones yeah. may be closer to new covenant theology, but nothing has been publicly stated most of the average people, especially at the master's university and the professors there, which are, it's a college, not a seminary, most of those over there are more leaning towards classical dispensationalism. Wow. And they're being taught the whole nine yards of the restoration of Israel, the Israel church distinction mm. and all of that. And when you try to press them on, well, but you do realize that MacArthur calls himself a leaky dispensationalist. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And how does that fit in relation to progressive dispensationalism? They all clam up and they don't want to say anything because it's a politically sensitive topic. And of course, ultimately, it goes back to what it goes back to. You don't want to offend the donor base. <laughs> right, right. 